My name is Greg Washington. I'm the Dean of the Henry Sam Whaley School of Engineering, and I'm also a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I am Henry Samueli. I am an adjunct professor at UCI as well as a donor and an advisor to the chancellor as well as the dean of the School of Engineering. My interest in uh, engineering dates back to when I was in junior high school. When I was in the seventh grade, I took an electric shop class and as part of a class project, I uh, bought a kit from Heathkit, which is like Radio Shack, and built a uh, AM FM shortwave radio as a semester course project. And I was so fascinated by assembling this thing, putting the wires together and plugging it in at the end of the year and sound came out, that it became my mission in life to figure out how that radio worked and hence I pursued electrical engineering from the seventh grade. So it was a pretty easy decision for me, pretty unusual I think for somebody in the seventh grade to figure out their career, but that's how I got started. Well, my interest in the field of engineering came through happenstance and that it, uh, I, I really didn't know what an engineer did or what engineering was. I uh, really became interested in physics and in mathematics. And uh, growing up as a kid, I always had an interest in those subjects, but I had this uncanny problem that my mom used to always, she hated buying me toys or electronic gadgets or anything of the like, because literally within a day or two after I had received them, they would be taken apart. And uh, it, it finally gotten so bad that what she told me is that she would only buy me Tonka trucks. And if you know what a Tonka truck is, it's this really rigid, beefy, and, uh, and when I took the Tonka trucks apart. She actually <laughs> thought I had a problem. <laughs> um, you know, fast forward, and that was really the basis of trying to get an understanding of how things worked. And uh, it wasn't until I uh, was in high school that a, a teacher, my physical sciences teacher, actually recognized it. And what became a problem all my life had become an asset at that time. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles in West Hollywood, went to Fairfax High School, and it went, when it became time to apply for a university, the natural choice was UCLA. It was close to the house. The tuition was extremely cheap, $600 a year. Oh, My parents cheap. couldn't afford to send me away to school, and I certainly couldn't afford to go to USC. Uh, so I only applied to UCLA, and fortunately I was admitted there, and I pursued electrical engineering as an undergraduate, and when I finished, I continued on because I just loved school. I loved what I was learning. So I continued on to graduate school at UCLA and then finished my master's and then continued on past that and finished my PhD. So I went straight through for nine years from freshman through PhD uh, at UCLA and uh, that began my attachment to the University of California. Well, you know, for me, my choice of graduate school really came from looking at a few choices in the undergraduate, as an undergraduate, I, I knew I was going to go to graduate school uh, in general because I had uh, had a really hard time understanding some of my professors in college and all of my TAs. They were mostly foreign TAs. And uh, I remember taking a visit to the dean at that time and uh, as a being a student leader on campus sitting down with the dean and I asked him what was he going to do about this problem we were struggling as students with TAs that we really <clears throat> couldn't understand and uh, and he said that he was putting some mechanisms in place to help resolve that issue that it was frankly quite difficult to get American students to go on to graduate school. And at the end of that meeting, as all of the students were filing out of his office, he tapped me on the shoulder and turned me around and said, you have to decide whether you're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution. I'll tell you right now that if you decide to go to graduate school and you decide to go here, 
you will not have to pay for it. I will make sure it's covered and we'll give you a stipend to boot. Now, <laughs> I did not know at that time that most students who went to graduate school uh, received some sort of stipend in engineering. And, uh, but it was sounded great to me. And uh, he also arranged for me to work in a lab of a faculty member. And so I knew graduate school was gonna be a direction. I was basically groomed that way from a sophomore. Uh, by the time it became time to choose, I had originally decided to go to Georgia Tech uh, for graduate school, and I had some family issues and some other things that uh, precluded me leaving the state of North Carolina, and so I wind up staying at NC State and pursuing my uh, master's and PhD there. Well, my graduate research uh, for my doctorate focused on a field called digital signal processing. It was a new field at the time. This is uh, in the mid-70s, and uh, it was an emerging field, and today it is a gigantic field. But back then, it was fun to be part of the start of a, a brand new field of endeavor in engineering. And I pursued this field, and when I graduated in 1980, I went and took a job in the defense industry at a company called TRW, working on military broadband communication systems and applying this knowledge I had of digital signal processing to communication systems. And uh, it was a great, great opportunity for me because uh, it was, again, a new field of engineering that I could apply in a real practical way on uh, these military communication systems. So I, I learned so much in that, those first few years working in industry at TRW. This was a great experience. Well, <clears throat> I knew early on, even in grad school, that I wanted to be an academic. It was very clear to me. Uh, but I had this fascination with working in industry as well. And so I was able to get a, an opportunity uh, to work at Ford Motor Company for a little while before transitioning on into my academic career. And that, and that, that was good because it grounded me in terms of giving me an, an understanding of what some of the problems and issues uh, uh, that industry was facing and what are some of the problems and issues that I should be grounded in as an academic. Um, my area is dynamic systems. I focused on uh, anything that moved or stood still or uh, and I started getting into and in, in, involved with what we call complex dynamic systems. I mean, systems that had uh, mechanical components, electrical components, electromagnetic uh, components, thermal, heat. The more different issues acting on the system, the more excited I was about the problem. And uh, I was able to move that direction, move in that direction. I, I, I would say fairly easily. It opened up a world of complex phenomena and solving complex problems that, uh, in, in my opinion, was necessary at the time in which I came in. Um, I, I then converged to this area called adaptive materials, which looked at uh, all sorts of different inputs coming in on uh, materials and looked at those materials' responses to those inputs. And uh, it was an area that was ideally suited for someone like me because I had been dealing with complex phenomena all of my academic career. And so uh, that led to a very, very fruitful and productive academic career. Why I came to, and why, how did I get interested in UCI is a very interesting story. Uh, Irvine was always a place where I came to vacation. and. Uh, I was chosen to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Air Force. And every year for two weeks, we would come to Irvine uh, where we would go through our studies. We would study uh, major problems that the Air Force was dealing with at that time. And we would spend two weeks writing up our final reports for that. And that always took place, at, at least back in those days, it always took place at Irvine here at the uh, Beckman Institute. And uh, 
and I, and I just found it to be a wonderful place. It was, I would bring my family. Uh, the weather was great. It, even though it was in July, it usually wasn't too hot. Uh, I got the opportunity on occasion to come back here uh, in the fall and the winter. So I was very familiar uh, with this place. And um, I, I was actually uh, the, the Dean of Engineering at Arrival School uh, when I knew that I was gonna be transitioning from that program, I actually received a call from a faculty member here and said, look, this position, this Dean of Engineering position at Irvine is coming available. Would you consider applying? And I thought about it and I said, sure. I'd put, I'll put my name in the hat. I'm very familiar with the place. Had been to campus at least uh, five or six times before. So I had a real good feel for the institution in general. Not a whole lot for the actual School of Engineering, but a lot for the institution. And when was this? Oh, this was in 2010. Well, my story is kind of interesting as well as to how I became involved with UCI. <clears throat> I worked in industry for five years at uh, TRW working on uh, military broadband communication systems. And in 1985, I was offered a assistant professor faculty position at UCLA in the electrical engineering department. So I had this dilemma, what do I do? I can continue on with this extremely exciting job and career that I had at TRW, which I loved, or consider taking a faculty appointment with a considerable salary reduction, but at one of the world's preeminent research universities. It's a very difficult decision. Glad you did that, by the way. <laughs> right. So I talked it over with Susan, and uh, we decided uh, that it would be good for me to pursue my dream of being a, a professor at a, a premier academic institution. So I left TRW and, and joined UCLA as an assistant professor, and this was in 1985. So I spent 10 years full-time at UCLA as a professor of electrical engineering, and towards the end of my tenure there, uh, that's when the idea for Broadcom came about. Um, we were doing some exciting research projects in, in, in chip, semiconductor chips for broadband communication systems and ultimately decided to spin out a company myself and one of my PhD students. So we started Broadcom and we started it in Westwood right next to the UCLA campus. We rented a, a 1,200 square foot office in a subleased it from a law firm in one of the high-rise office buildings on Wilshire Boulevard, and that's how Broadcom got started. So we slowly grew, and I stayed at UCLA teaching full-time and was working part-time at the company in the, in the early days, and I still had all my graduate students working for me. And the company slowly grew, and after a couple of years, we had about 30 people or so, and we decided we had to move. We couldn't stay in a sublease of a law firm in a high-rise office building, so we decided to search around and open the door of where we could possibly go to relo relocate the company in anticipation of growth to hundreds of people, potentially. So we looked in Santa Monica, we even considered the Bay Area, and one of our engineers who was working for us at the time actually lived in Orange County and commuted to Broadcom in Westwood. And he says, you guys have to come down to Irvine, take a look at it, it's a great place to live, great place to have a company. Who was that? His name was Naraman Yousefi. Is he still with the He's company? no longer with the company. He's, uh, he left and he's now CEO of a startup here in, in Orange County. So he uh, convinced us to come down, take a look. In fact, I'd never been to Irvine before that. I'd been to Laguna Beach and, you know, been to the beaches and so forth, but I hadn't been to the Irvine Spectrum and so forth. So we took a look and it actually looked pretty interesting. I mean, it, it was just growing. It was, there was plenty of office space available and uh, the housing was relatively inexpensive compared to Westwood or <laughs> back, Santa Monica. That was back then. Huh? So we talked it over with our wives and we decided, all right, we're gonna do it. We're gonna move down to Orange County. And we uh, rented an office in Irvine for the company and we moved down, moved our families down to Orange County. And that was in 1995 and uh, loved it. And we're working very happily there and I left UCLA at that time, took a leave of absence uh, from teaching, and was now full-time at the company in Irvine, um, starting in 1995. 
And then interestingly enough, uh, right around that time, one of my colleagues at UCLA, who was chairman of the department at the time, Nicholas Alexopoulos, was offered the position of Dean of Engineering here at UCI. And he took it, moved down, relocated down to uh, Irvine. And since I had such a close relationship with him, I, he was a colleague at UCLA, naturally he brought me in to familiarize myself with UCI and get uh, to know the school, and ultimately convinced me to make a, a major donation to, to the school, to name the school. And I did that actually at the same time that the dean at UCLA at the time, Frank Lazan, had talked to me about potentially making a major donation to UCLA because Broadcom had just gone public. In 1998, the company went public, the stock went through the roof, uh, generated enormous wealth for all the employees, including the founders. So we started, my wife and I started a foundation and decided we were going to make a major gift back to a, what created us to be what we, we were. And obviously the university was uh, the first choice there. So UCLA was a natural, but my relationship with Nick Alexopoulos, who had now become the dean at UCI, created another natural relationship because Broadcom was very close to UCI. We were hiring UCLI graduates, UCI graduates. So it was a natural relationship to build, and that's how it got started. Well, when Broadcom went public, Susan and I immediately created the foundation because we felt this commitment to give back to society from the fortunate wealth that was created by our success at Broadcom. And we felt that that was entirely due to our education that we received. I mean, we pretty much grew up in a middle class family environment, didn't have any wealth at all. Um, but it was our education. Susan also uh, was educated at a UC. She went to UC Berkeley and graduated with a bachelor's in mathematics. And of course, I had all my three degrees in electrical engineering at UCLA. So we owed our entire success in life to our education at the University of California. So for us, it was a natural, after we created our foundation, to give back to the university as a first thing, number one on the list. And uh, the UCLA and UCI, as, a, as the relationship developed with the d dean at the time, Nicola Alexopoulos, were the first two schools. And this was in 1999. The company went public in 98. So the, right in early 99, we made the major commitments to name both the UCLA and UCI schools of engineering with uh, large endowments. So to us, it wasn't even a, a question of if it was just a matter of when we were going to give back because we owed it all to our education. And we are very passionate about education, and that is really one of the major areas of focus of our foundation even until today. Well, <clears throat> I, I believe engineering has a profound impact on everyday life. And uh, I'll give two examples to kind of highlight that, that level of impact. Uh, just recently here in, in North Carolina, um, in South Carolina, which I still have family, uh, there was a significant flood. Uh, the type of flood where they were receiving somewhere in their neighborhood of about an inch of rain per hour for more than 24 hours. And it led to massive flooding, major damage. Uh, the commentary on this flood was that this was the sixth biblical flood to occur in the U.S. since the year 2010. The sixth biblical flood. And so you say, I didn't even, so I was reading this article, I didn't even know what a biblical flood was. I was like, really, a biblical <laughs> flood? I, I, I know the, the Bible, <laughs> and I was like, a biblical flood. And so uh, apparently uh, these occur about one every thousand years, hmm. unless you happen to be here in the U.S. over the last, you know, since 2000, I mean 2010, in which we've had six. And all of these uh, these entities uh, relate directly to climate change. And uh, climate change is brought about because of the production of CO2 in our environment. 
because of the production of CO2 in our atmosphere, and that comes from producing things, or the output of combustion. Those are all engineering processes. And uh, the solutions to solving that climate problem going forward will be an engineering solution. It's an engineering problem. And so that's one area. Uh, the second is that the rest of the world wants what we have. They, if you look globally and you see what's happening here in this country and you look at the advent of uh, what's happened to the microprocessor and what's happened to uh, the growth of uh, chips, uh, integrated circuits in this country. And we still see that for more than 40 years, we've been experiencing growth at the rate of every 18 months, the speed of these chips, something that I know you know very well, the speed of these chips has continued to double. And that is unleash uh, the greatest time of innovation that, that the world has ever seen. And that's the time in which we live. And so uh, we're seeing all sorts of products and now we're not just looking at computers that interface in our homes and in our cars and in our, uh, you know, on our bodies with cell phones. Uh, we're now interfacing computers with the human body. And the chips are now small enough and, and, and uh, uh, not so intrusive that you can actually do that today. And the outcomes of that is just going to be tremendous. So I'm looking forward to a time over the next three to five years where uh, the significance of, in, of engineering and its impact on the world will not only be something that is noticeable to an engineering dean, it will be clear to pretty much everybody on the planet. Well, you know, uh, you know, my vision for the discipline uh, expounds beyond my vision for this campus. And uh, uh, ultimately, my true vision is that we have reading, writing, and arithmetic is the kind of connotation we grew up with. And a, a person who was learned or a person who was educated had some knowledge in all areas. And now there needs to be a fourth entity added to that, and that entity is technology. And, and so individuals who, uh, who grow up in our society today, they have to know how to read, they have to know how to write, they have to know how to, the basics of uh, mathematics and science, but now they also have to have an understanding of the built or the technology-based environment in which they live. I think that's gonna be critical for our path forward as a human race. And I believe that UC Irvine can be one of the key institutions globally in making sure that that impact is felt. We can do that with our undergraduate programs, our graduate programs, but also our impact and our partnerships with entities like the Sam Whaley Foundation, entities like others around our campus in terms of impacting the surrounding area and impacting the country, in terms of understanding uh, the impact of science and technology on everyday life. Well, it's <clears throat> very clear to me that the next generation of students uh, must be exposed and learn about technology. Technology pervades everything. It's hard to imagine any career that you pursue that you don't take advantage of technology in some way, shape, or form. And our kids, certainly they know how to use iPads and iPhones, but I think they need to take it a step further and really understand what makes up these devices, how are they built, get their hands dirty, roll up their sleeves. So that's, in fact, one of the passions of, of our foundation and our funding at the younger levels is to promote hands-on so-called STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math, where kids work on 
after school projects and build things and build robots or whatever they want to do to stimulate them to get excited about pursuing a career in STEM. And we're doing that because we truly believe that it's essential to their future success. If you want to get a successful job where you're going to make a decent amount of money, it, you have to have some sort of technology sophistication. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost essential going forward into the future. So starting at a young age, whether it's in elementary school or middle school, certainly in high school, to prepare yourself to enter college and even if you don't major in engineering, but even getting exposed to some engineering classes potentially or computer programming classes, just so that you have a little bit of sophistication about the field of technology will be a critical factor in, in your overall future success. So uh, I strongly believe that that has to be a mission of the university, not only to teach technology and engineering, but to stimulate that learning at the younger levels and to do outreach into the community and work with the middle schools, work with the high schools to get the kids excited about pursuing careers in engineering and science. So actually, we, we have a number of them. Um, our programs now, our outreach and engagement programs stem from elementary all the way up through community college. And, and uh, what we are now doing is we are touching the lives of students pretty much at every genre, at every level. And the idea here is because we actually source students from all of those places. So you start making literally an engineer in the fifth and sixth grade today. And so we have to have them motivated enough uh, and engaged enough in math and science so that they can take Algebra 1 by the 8th grade. And once they're involved and they, they're on that track, they can graduate with the basic prerequisites to get into an engineering program. And so we start with them very, very early. Uh, we now have programs that uh, will go easily down to the third and the fourth grade. Uh, we are, we really start to focus on them from the fifth through the 10th grade through our fab camp and our app camp programs. Uh, <clears throat> and then beyond that, we have our Aspire, our Inspire programs that focus on uh, high schoolers and then uh, community college students as well to help them matriculate through. It is, phenomenal to see what we've been able to do in just five years in terms of being able to impact this community. We're now uh, uh, easily reaching somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 5,000 youth per year. And we also have arguably one of the strongest MESA programs in uh, definitely in Orange County and pretty much in all of California. And so when you add all of that together, I feel really proud about the, what, we've, what we've been able to accomplish in this general area. Have you faced any challenges? <laughs> you can't do anything in this life without facing a major challenge. And um, the biggest challenge that, that we've had to overcome, that we're still overcoming it, is culture. Uh, and so we are changing the culture to one that actually sees our community and engages our community, sees, you know, we have to be the institution that the community not only wants to be here, but needs to be here. And that means that you have to have a different relationship with all aspects of the community, not just K through 12, but also with industry, you have to have a different uh, relationship with non-governmental organizations or NGOs, all of that is incredibly important to us in uh, moving us from a culture of just educating the student that was in front of us to one that's engaging with the whole community is something that uh, we had to change and we're, and we're still changing. Uh, after cultures, always money. <laughs> so you got to find the resources to achieve the vision that you want to achieve. And 
um, and I think we've 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 done reasonably well at being able to do both. Well, my relationship with <clears throat> UCI uh, is now going on 20 years. Uh, ever since we mo moved to Orange County in '95, I began that relationship uh, with the dean back then, Nicol Exopolis, with the chancellors back then as well, and the progression of the school not only the School of Engineering, but the university at large has been quite remarkable over that 20-year period. Uh, the infrastructure, the amount of uh, new buildings that have been put on campus, the growth in faculty in engineering, the strength of the programs, the rankings have consistently gone up, the quality of the students, the quality of the faculty, and our incoming GPAs keep climbing. It's just a rapid, rapid advance in quality. And, uh, and UCI is a very young school, so this, it's not easy to catch up to the incumbents who've been there for decades, if not centuries longer than UCI. So uh, it's a real challenge, but yet uh, the school has done phenomenally well at accelerating and closing the gap to the more mature established schools, uh, not only in the region, but in the country. So kudos to everybody on campus for, for making that a huge success. Well, I've maintained a, a relationship with the University of California ever since uh, uh, I was a student. So, um, and even in recent years, uh, I've maintained relationships not only with UCI deans and chancellors, but with UCLA deans and chancellors, and with the president of the University of California now, Janet Napolitano, um, because I feel very, it's very important for UC being a public institution to have the support of the community. Uh, I mean, UC is probably the pre preeminent public university in the world. And I feel it's really important to help out in any way I can as an advisor, as a donor. And I serve on committees from Dean's Advisory Councils to Chancellor's Advisory Councils to UC President's Advisory Councils. And it's really my pleasure to do that because any way I can help to give my knowledge, uh, to impart my knowledge, is certainly something that I'm very proud to do. Well, one way I've affiliated myself with the school, given that I'm an adjunct professor here, so once a year I teach a uh, entrepreneurship lecture. It's not a whole course, it's just one lecture. I come in uh, and there is an entrepreneurship course uh, at the undergraduate and graduate students attend as well. And uh, so I give a lecture, and it's actually quite enjoyable because you know I talk for about 45 minutes, and then I answer questions for about another 45 minutes. And it's really exciting to see the students, and and you see their eyes get big and light up because they get so excited about the potential opportunities to take the knowledge that they've gained at the university and potentially use them in an entrepreneurship way to start companies or to join startups. Uh, and you can see the, the lights going off in their brain and, and the interesting questions they ask. So to me, it's fun for me to give back in that way to impart that knowledge directly to the students, especially the, the knowledge I've gained over the years as an entrepreneur, and to uh, give them advice uh, and to pursue potential careers along that path as well. So to me, that's one of the more enjoyable things that I do is that annual uh, entrepreneurship lecture. For me, what I enjoy, what I remember, uh, is is the students, uh, the the undergraduate students in particular, and uh, I spend a lot of time with them and and try to engage them as often as I can. I remember one story of a kid who was struggling in a dynamics class and uh, really didn't understand how to model. Uh, these systems and was starting to question whether he should be an engineer or not or and 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 whether UCI was the best place for him and I remember saying why don't you come sit in my lab and I sat down with him uh, and we went to the whiteboard and I just went through and started explaining to him how things worked and you know a, a, as a dean we spent a lot of time in administrative meetings and engaging uh, with people from all different walks of life. And sometimes you can get into the grind of that and you miss the fundamental aspect of what actually makes a university great. And seeing that kid get it 
when he understood. And that kid's a graduate student today. And to see him go from literally getting ready to leave the profession to being a graduate student in the profession and because someone took time with him. In this particular case, it happened to be me, but it could have been others. Uh, really helped me to see the impact that an institution can have. And I really felt good about uh, not only the fact that, uh, that I was here, but the overall impact that I could possibly have being here. What, what I aspire to do is to impact the way in which we educate students today. And uh, my ultimate goal is to put in place an educational framework that changes the way in which we educate people, that makes it more engaging, more hands-on, uh, more along the lines of uh, teaching towards uh, uh, helping people to understand the physical world and how it interacts with us today and uh, bringing in the equations and the mathematics and all of that after the motivation is actually there and created with the students for those mathematics. And so uh, my ultimate goal is to be one of a core group of people that actually at the end of the day could say we, we laid one of the foundational bricks for helping to impact uh, that change and to make that change a reality. I think UCI has some wonderful opportunities in front of it. I mean, when you consider how young of a university it is at age 50, it's one of the youngest universities in the world. Yet the accomplishments have been remarkable just up to this point. So I can only imagine on the path it's on over the next 50 years, what greatness will come out of this university and this region. So to me, that's one of the most exciting things. I think it's on a glide path that is much steeper than its peers. And I think it's going to steadily climb the ladder and become, it already is an elite institution, but it's going to become one of the elite institutions in the world. And it's exciting to sit here and watch that university year after year. You can see the difference on relatively short time frames. And uh, to me, that's the most exciting part, is to see the change, to see the culture change, to see the community rally around the university. And that will happen and will continue to happen over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And that's very exciting. Personally, my goal is to continue to help. You know, Broadcom is a very successful company and it's continuing to grow and uh, hiring students, hiring engineers. and creating the partnerships with the local universities is an important mission of ours and we're a global company so it's not just UC Irvine that we create partnerships. We have sites all around the world and try to create partnerships with local universities uh, nearby all of those sites. It just happens that UC Irvine happens to be one of the major ones as well as UCLA and some of the Northern California schools since the bulk of the employees are in the state of California. But to me that is our mission is to help in any way we can because, again, our employees are ultimately educated by universities and, in particular, University of California educates the largest amount of students that we do hire as a company. So, to me, that is one of my personal missions is to continue to help in any way I can going forward and to leave a mark on, on the university. In terms of accomplishments, uh, we have major accomplishments happening pretty much uh, every year. Every year something new and exciting happens. This past year, uh, one of our faculty members uh, uh, just won the Blavatnik Award, um, which is the most prestigious award given to a faculty member under 35 years of age. Um, our rankings in many of our departments uh, continues to skyrocket, and that bodes well upon not just the school, but upon individual hires that we've, uh, that we've made. Uh, we've been able to hire some really outstanding faculty from other places. Um, so we recently hired the best faculty member from the University of Michigan. Uh, we've uh, also, uh, I just got word yesterday that we uh, 
for the University of Minnesota, we just hired uh, their best uh, uh, water scientist and their best controls person. They happen to be a husband and wife pair, and so that that's great. Uh, when you can get when you can get a twofer, that's <laughs> that's outstanding. And uh, we just continue to I, I'm I'm continue to be amazed at the at the level of growth and impact that we're able to have, and. Uh, uh, I'm continuing to be amazed at the level of uh, reverence and respect that people have for such a young institution. You know, if you look through periods in time, one of the things we see is that there was a period of time in which uh, Berkeley would establish itself as the flagship institution in, a, a, as part of the University of California. And then, uh, UCLA came behind that it's, and established itself as a world-class institution. And, and then you see the others kind of follow in lockstep from uh, Santa Barbara to San Diego uh, to Davis. Now it's just UC Irvine's turn. And this university is now positioned uh, from being the number one institution under 50 years of age, it's now 50. And so the question becomes, what is in store for the next 50 years? So for the next 50 years, the institution will continue its ascent. And my fundamental philosophy is, is that that, is, that ascent is not possible without in the ascent of some key programs on this campus and engineering, and in my opinion, being one of them. And so, we will continue to grow, we will continue to ascent, and we will continue to be a part of the institution's growth moving forward. Thanks a lot for talking with Thank us. Thank you, Greg. It's really been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. All right. Enjoyed it. Thank you.